very deep on Ripken. All three outfielders just a few strides from the warning track. They would be deep on anybody because the man on second means nothing. They are deep and put that way by La Russa because you want, do not want to have an extra base hit. Give him a single, let him drive home the run, but keep him out of scoring position. Two out, two on in the bottom of the ninth. High to left field. Unfortunately, we lost to Milwaukee. It's over. We needed to win all four of the remaining games against them. We won the first three and lost the last one. The Milwaukee Brewers have defeated the Baltimore Orioles, and they have won the American League Eastern Division Championship for 1982. To this day, that's the most disappointing loss that I've ever had. And Earl Weaver is crying. A man who in 15 years has become an absolute legend. The most successful manager in franchise history had retired. But after a bitter end to the 82 season, the Baltimore Orioles were already looking ahead. We were so close in 82, so the next year, as I remember it, you know, we were, we were urgent. Once spring training arrived, the birds emerged from hibernation with high expectations and a new skipper charged with managing them. The American League East certainly is a tough division. It's not going to be easy to win it, but I think all a manager can ask for is a competitive team. Sophomore jinx. You feel like something like that exists because of the pressure of being rookie of the year? Well, I really don't believe too much in the sophomore jinx. As long as I adjust, and I think that I'll have a pretty good year. Out West, the White Sox had a spring in their step and an enviable starting rotation as 19-game winner Lamar Hoyt was joined by Floyd Bannister, the defending AL strikeout king. They put a lot of fresh money and enthusiasm into the franchise, and we had some young pitchers that were now starting to get some experience. So we went into 83, and we felt like we were a legitimate contender. In Baltimore, the dynamic duo of Eddie Murray and Cal Ripken Jr., who had combined for 60 home runs the previous season, began 1983 with a power outage. I probably didn't get off to the fastest start. And Ripken is gone. But I don't remember the early struggles when you look back on it. Uh, I know we had a couple of seven or eight game losing streaks. With their big bats not yet booming, the Birds finished May only four games over 500, just fourth in the AL East. Swing and a miss, he struck him out, it's over. The Orioles wind up in the loss column. In Chicago, another rookie's bat was drawing attention. An undrafted former steel worker. Kittle didn't have the same pedigree as Straw, but his power was undeniable. Bob Kittle's one of the strongest guys you'll ever see. A tremendous home run on top by Kittle. On the roof. And it was fun watching Ron Kittle break into to the big leagues. And Kitty was a big asset to that 83 ball club. I was honored to have a uniform to play at this caliber. 50 home runs last year in AAA in Edmonton. I went out there to compete, give it my best every single day, and I also wanted to be the hero every game. Number 13 for Kittle, just tied for the Major League lead at home run. The newcomer represented a silver lining for the White Sox, who were five games under 500 at the end of May. Another club that was grounded early, the Orioles, who had yet to take flight under their new skipper. Another was underway in Baltimore. Where shortstop Cal Ripken Jr. had played in every game since May 30th, 1982. The Orioles team in general got better as the year went on. The early part of the season was about getting our pitching staff all lined up, so I don't remember being that worried. We had some young kids like Mike Boddicker and Al Ramirez come up. Storm Davis filled in. He became a starter and did a great job. No one had really expected us to be where we are right now. The Birds went 19-7 and in July and climbed to the very top of a tight AL East race. In Chicago, sunny days for the White Sox. A six-and-a-half game lead in the West after a slow start. Well, I think the first six weeks we struggled as a club. Everybody struggled, and I think since after those six weeks, uh, we have been a very consistent club in all departments. We still don't feel like we've been red hot. Everybody, like you get it really going sometimes where you can't do anything wrong. We don't think we really hit that streak yet. We've just been a consistent club now just about every day out for the last three months. Lamar Hoyt has been Mr. Consistency on the mound of late with five straight victories for a 15-10 and 10 record. 
and the Major's first 15-game winner. He's also the American League's winningest pitcher over the last two seasons. I like to think of myself as being a little versatile. Like, I can do anything that's called for. Like, if I need to strike somebody out in a certain situation, I can do that. If I need a double play, I can get the double play. It's like the situation. Whatever situation, I feel like I, I can adjust to that situation. The White Sox adjusted to Billy Martin's Yankees just fine. They took game one at Yankee Stadium and then sent a rejuvenated Floyd Bannister to the mound for game two. Bannister's been simply awesome since the All-Star break, winning eight straight, including this one, and raising his once 3-9 and nine record to 11-9, and nine, allowing just 13 earned runs in 56 and a third innings. Harold Baines has been the main man in the clutch, collecting his 13th game-winning RBI. Julio Cruz has been the catalyst and a coach's delight. Having uh, Juice Cruz uh, was just a welcome addition to our ball club because we really didn't have a lot of team speed. Rudy Laws, he's second in the American League of Stolen Bases, and he was our, he's our main guy that makes things happen. But now he's got somebody down there bat ninth that would give us a pretty good, you know, 9-1 combination. Rudy Law and Julio Cruz rank second and third in the league in steals, with Law having 55, Cruz 48, a Chicago combo that helped the Sox to a three-game sweep in New York. When we last left Baltimore's Len Sakata back in May, he was still in search of his first base hit ever against the White Sox. Sakata had gone without a hit against the Sox in 66 at-bats over a period of seven seasons. Now that's what you call an offer. Oh, for 66, that is. But alas, all streaks must stop. Sakata drilled a seventh inning single against Chicago to finally break the jinx. His first base hit lifted a heavy burden. It also lifted the opposing pitcher right out of the ball game. Although the Shy Sox won 22 games in August and September, their style was branded as winning ugly. You know, we'd go along and it didn't look like we are going to win, and then something would happen and give us a little open. The Sox take a 4-2 lead. Then that's not winning ugly. That's uh, intimidation. And no one was more intimidating that season than Lamar Hoyt. Lamar Hoyt was... Uh, big rotund guy and people would wonder how in the world can this guy be a baseball player but I'll tell you what impeccable control Got him. Just blew him away with a high the white Sox. Every time he took the mound from July through the end of the season 14 starts in a row White Sox starters dominated the AL as Hoyt combined with Floyd Bannister and Richard Dotson to go 42 and 5 in the second half. What a game by Dotson. We had smart pitchers on the mound with the hitters that we had in the lineup that we had a chance to win a ball game, and uh, we proved it that year. Kittle's 35 home runs earned him the AL Rookie of the Year award, and Greg Luzinski's 32 helped him win the award for outstanding DH. It's got a chance to go on the roof! Home run on the roof! The third one this year for the ball, and nobody has ever done that before! The White Sox won 50 of their final 66 games to take control of the West. There was no doubt that we were going to clinch, just by how much. They would finish with a 20-game cushion over second-place Kansas City. September 17th, uh, magic number was one. We had another great crowd at the ballpark, and we had it tied in the bottom of the ninth inning. Harold Baines delivered a game-winning sacrifice fly, and the White Sox celebrated their first postseason berth since 1959. The Chicago White Sox, the 1983 Western Champions in the American League. 
As the season reached the dog days, the AL East was still up for grabs, though everyone was looking up at the defending division champs. The O's power outage in April was a distant memory as they were slugging and soaring in the second half. We had a great run in late August and into September to try and catch the Brewers in our division, and we did. During an eight-game winning streak, Cal Ripken Jr. contributed four home runs and ten runs batted in. In the second half, I caught fire. I was trying to contribute and trying to help the team win, and my average continued to climb and climb. Ripken hit 393 in September as the O's took control and then tightened their grip on the division. We win dramatically. I'm not kidding. Uh, seventh, eighth, ninth inning, sometimes, I mean, we come back. It's a different hero every night. The ball game is over. That is hard to believe. Right behind Rifkin in the lineup was protection of the best kind. All-star first baseman Eddie Murray, who finished the season with a career-high 33 home runs. Team leading 111 RBIs as the birds headed to October. Didn't really get any recognition pretty much all year. We kept winning and winning, and nobody really knew it. So I'd say that uh, if Chicago wins ugly, we win very quietly. There was nothing quiet about Ripken's 83 campaign. With 27 home runs and 102 RBIs, he became the first player in history to win the Rookie of the Year and MVP awards in successive seasons. Mid-September at Comiskey Park, the White Sox have already made a shambles of the AL West race. Now they go for the clincher. Harold Baines' sacrifice fly scores Julio Cruz, and the White Sox are in postseason play for the first time since the Luis Aparicio, Nelly Fox early win team of 1959. Plenty of cause for celebration on Chicago's south side. For the Baltimore Orioles, the winning never becomes old hat. Their seventh division title since the playoff system began in 1969. They broke open a very tight AL East race in late August, went on a tear, and won going away. Now the White Sox and Birds, game one, best of five on NBC. presents the American League Championship Series. Series, and it's brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? By Miller High Life, the best beer for the best time of the day. Welcome to Miller Time by the Texas Instruments Home Computer, creating useful products and services for you. And by Kmart K-Care Auto Centers, with our promise of service, value, and satisfaction. We've got it good. in the forecast for Baltimore today, but as game time approaches, sunny skies at Memorial Stadium, sellout crowd, about 53,000 here, and the game time temperature, 82 degrees. Hi, everybody. Bob Costas, along with Tony Kubek, welcome to a very interesting best-of-five series. 
for a trip to the World Series. Chicago won 99 this year, most in baseball. Baltimore was right behind with 98. Lamar Hoyt, 24-game winner for the Shy Sox. The left-hander Scott McGregor, who won 18, goes for Baltimore. They're awfully close in almost every category, Tony. Is there any area of difference that might be a telling factor? Bob, the standard line among so-called experts has been flip a coin, they're too evenly matched. If you're going to look for factors that might be important, how about the White Sox team speed? Tony LaRusso had a meeting with Davey Nelson, his base running, base stealing coach, and Davey Nelson said, we've got to keep the threat of steel in the minds of the Orioles at all times. So they will be taking a lot of false starts. In fact, Joel Tabelli has even caught Rick Dempsey against the right hander. So the threat of a steal is in the mind of the Orioles. As far as a pivotal figure, how about Carlton Fisk, the way he's caught over the last four months and the way he's hit? And will the experience factor come into play? 15 of the Orioles on this roster played in the 1979 World Series. Only six White Sox have postseason experience and none of that as teammates. We'll come back with the starting lineups when we return to Memorial Stadium in just a minute. Here's your chance to get the official 1983 World Series program, a collector's item commemorating the 80th Fall Classic. Send check or money order for $4 to World Series Program, Post Office Box 9800, St. Paul, Minnesota 55198. Please make checks payable to World Series Program and allow six weeks for delivery. That's World Series Program, Box 9800, St. Paul, Minnesota 55198. The preceding message was furnished by Major League Baseball. Tony La Russa, manager of the Chicago White Sox. Our lineup today, leading off is Rudy Law in center field. Rudy's been igniting our offense all year long. I guess the biggest question is, can he get on base? Because the Orioles is one club that's got him out pretty good. I figure he's due. Hitting seconds, our catcher, Carlton Fist, had a big offensive and defensive year, 26 home runs. And in Carlton's case, has been an excellent number two hitter in the sense he can take a pitch for Rudy, hits the ball to the right side, and if he's not on base, sometimes he leaves the yard. Third hitter, Tom Pachorek, who's been our hottest hitter in the month of September. Our only 300 hitter, he'll play first base. The Bulls, our cleanup hitter, had a big year as a DH, the all-time record for DH home runs, and had another 90-plus RBI year. Hitting fifth is our rookie, Ron Kittle, who led our club in home runs and RBIs and has played a good left field. Hitting six is our most consistent player all year long. In fact, he set an AO record for game-winning RBIs, Harold Baines, and he'll hit in the sixth spot. Hitting seventh is our third baseman, Vance Law, has come along and I think has played as well defensively as anybody in the league and, in, and offensively does a real good job handling the bat and moving hit runners along. Hitting eighth is our rookie shortstop, Scott Fletcher. Scott has been playing very well defensively and stuck in a lot of key hits, much like Vance, can do a lot of things with the bat as far as handling it in different situations. Our ninth hitter is uh, Julio Cruz, switch hitter hitting right-handed against Scott McGregor today, has done a real good job, knocked in over 50 runs as a ninth-place hitter, and has shown a real knack for the game-winning RBI. Defensively, he's one of the best as far as range and turning the double play. Our starting pitcher, Lamar Hoyt, and you know most of his numbers. The big thing that we like about Lamar is the day he pitches, he does a real good job of keeping us in the game. And the same can be said of this fellow, the veteran left-hander Scott McGregor, wears number 16, the same number as his boyhood idol Whitey Ford. And in addition to those impressive numbers, he did not miss a start all season long. 36 starts, never missed one. And during the time that Mike Flanagan and Jim Palmer were on the disabled list, he was 11 and 2 with an ERA of 2.28. So he helped keep them in the pennant race. All right, the defense behind Scotty McGregor. We'll show you how they'll set up. Rick Dempsey catching today because of the speed of the White Sox. Eddie Murray, the switch hitter, as good as there is defensively at first base. Rich Dower, the second baseman, very, very steady. Hal Ripken, Jr. He's at shortstop, and he has excellent range to his left. Todd Cruz, who has taken some pressure off Ripken, he goes well to his left, as Brooksy did. John Lowenstein, he'll be in left field. Al Bumbry in center field, a man that the White Sox might want to run on in his arm. He plays very deep. Dan Ford is starting today, hits Hoyt very well. Another area where Al Tabelli is not going with a platoon system. There's Joe Al Tabelli and Jimmy Williams. Rudy Law steps in, two for 36, an average of 0.56 against Baltimore pitching this year, and he takes a strike. Both pitchers today control artists. 
Hoyt has the best walks to nine innings pitch ratio in baseball and McGregor is number two so if there are any free passes issued today form will have gone out the window law hits it on the ground and Murray a gold glover field steps on the bag for the first out. With Rudy Law starting the game despite his notable lack of success against Baltimore, it's obvious that the running game is a key part of Tony La Russa's strategy. So already for Law, the first hitter, you might have seen that Todd Cruz of third was up on the grass. Eddie Murray at first base was well in. Here's Carlton Fisk, who's been on a tear. Is it coincidental? When he had a little bit of a disagreement with Tony La Russa, they clashed. Fisk was moved to the number two spot. He'd been hitting down in the lineup. He said, I am not productive there. I do not do part of the offense. He's been on a tear since hitting number two. Mike takes a strike. On June 15th, he was batting 197 with just five home runs. They moved him to the number two spot. He's hit well over 300 since then to finish at 289. Scotty McGregor with a great straight change, but he actually gets more hitters out with his fastball. He will throw the same kind of pitch of Hoyt, that backdoor curveball. He will start at a foot to two feet outside the right-handed hitters. It will catch the outside corner. So for both McGregor and Hoyt, important that they have a pitcher's umpire behind home. But Jim McKean has a fairly wide strike zone. 1-1 one, one pitch. 2-1 and one the count. Jim McKean is the plate umpire. Derwood Merrill at first. Nick Bremigan at second. Jim Evans the umpire at third. And with the six umps in postseason play, Dave Phillips down the line and left. Mike Riley and Wright all have championship series experience with the exception of Riley. Two and two to Fisk. Scotty McGregor, two balls, one strike to Fisk. Pulls the string, has Fisk out in front. McGregor, the kind of guy you will say pitches backwards. He does not throw fastballs when he's behind in the count. It's kind of a trademark of the American League. His delivery is so deceiving. He throws across his body and many of his pitches with his extension. Here you'll see it. Hit hard, but Todd Cruz is right there. There is a story in this series. Cruz has not hit well at all, and even though his reputation is as a good defensive third baseman, there are questions about his ability in the clutch. But with two left-handers starting in this series, including McGregor today and a lot of right-handed batters in the White Sox lineup, Aldabelli opts to go with Cruz rather than take a chance with an inexperienced third baseman who might have a better bat. Man has pushed his average up from 240, and you see where it is now. That was just a couple of months ago he was at 240. Swings and misses for strike one. This is the third straight season that Pachorek has topped 300. Off-speed pitch on two. Scotty McGregor, a very fortunate young man in that he came to the Yankee organization, and as one of his mentors or tutors, it was Whitey Ford, who taught him to change speeds. In a certain sense, he may have become Baltimore's Whitey Ford. Not overpowering, but the guy you count on in the clutch situation. Two and two, in the only LCS appearance of McGregor's career, he pitched a six-hit shutout to beat California and clinch the series in 1979. Cruz gets another chance. Handles it flawlessly. And the White Sox are gone 1-2-3 in the top half of the first. We'll be right back after these messages from your local station. We go to the last of the first in Baltimore. Here's the Oriole lineup. Center fielder Al Bumbry is the leadoff man. Followed by right fielder Dan Ford nursing a sore foot and doubtful up until game time. Then the leading candidates for MVP, the shortstop Cal Ripken hitting number three, and the cleanup man and first baseman Eddie Murray. With the right-hander Lamar Hoyt on the mound, the left-handed hitting John Lowenstein plays left field and bats fifth, followed by switch hitter and designated hitter Ken Singleton in the sixth spot. Rich Dower, the second baseman, bats seventh. Todd Cruz, a big question mark in this series, is the third baseman hitting eighth, and the catcher Rick Dempsey bats ninth. Lamar Hoyt on the mound for the White Sox. 24 wins, 10 losses. Wait till you see the number of bases on balls that Hoyt has allowed. He has pitched a little over 260 innings. That is amazing. 31 of his 36 starts. He started 17 ball games where he allowed no walks. 
11 of his starts, just one walk through the entire game. He can't control the strike zone. 36-year-old Al Bumbry has been with this club longer than any active Oriole other than Jim Palmer. Takes a strike. And like Rudy Law, they are close at the corners for Bumbry. Even though he had some ankle problems a few years back, there's Vance Law tight. But Charik is tight at first. Off-speed pitch, top to the right side with Cruz coming in quickly. Underhands to Pachorek for the out. That man right there is as good defensively as anybody in baseball. We're going to show you the rest of the White Sox defense. Pudge Fist, the right who has controlled the young pitching 15. staff. Tom Pachorek, he'll be at first base. Four. Julio Cruz, they call him Juice. He's at second. Great range both ways, acrobatic. Scott Fletcher, start of the season, had some problems, is steady down. Vance Law, shortstop last year, this year at third base. Ron Kittle, who will surprise you with his speed in the outfield. Rudy Law, his throwing arm not strong, but he can go get the ball. And in right field, the best all-around all athlete for the White Sox, Harold Baines. See that necklace on Hoyt's neck? It's a lightning bolt figure, and he says he wears it because he works like lightning. He won't take much time between pitches. Disco Danny Ford steps in. Breaking ball for a strike after a woeful 1982. Ford has bounced back to respectable figures, dividing time with Jim Dwyer in right field for the Orioles. Quickly 0-2. There have been occasions this season when Joel Tabelli has platooned at five different positions. Right field off and on has been one. El Tabelli, who has removed the shadow of the great Earl Weaver from off his back, and he had to manage a pitching staff that really went south on him. But Ford, because he hits Hoyt so well, over 380 lifetime, is playing against Hoyt instead of Dwyer. Fouled away, and it's still 0-2. Lamar Hoyt, along with Rich Dotson, became the first 20-game winners for the White Sox this year since Jim Cott in 1975. Cal Ripken. I'll tell you what Ripken is doing. There's a man behind home plate who charts pitches, charts velocity of pitchers, and relays hand signals to the on-deck hitters. And as a pattern develops with Hoyt, Ripken wants to know how hard does he throw, what does the radar gun show? The break on his uh, curveball, what kind of control does he have? It's an unusual system that they have here that really transcends using the computers. The statistics say that Ford handles Hoyt pretty well, Tony. Around 400 against him. He's fouled three in a row away, and the count holds at 0-2. We've talked about the amazing control of Hoyt and McGregor, the two starting pitchers. If you picture the front of home plate, 17 inches wide, and the diameter of the baseball about two and a half, that's five inches on each side. If these two guys throw 200 pitches today, you can take the middle 10 inches of that plate away, because they are on the black all day long when they are right. Again, the 0-2, a waste pitch. As a team, the Orioles take a lot of pitches. They lead the league in on-base percentage. They have some fellows with high walk totals. But against Hoyt, that's sometimes a futile strategy. Struck him out. You're talking about a fastball when you start looking for breaking balls that he threw about 90 miles an hour. Tony La Russa. He has pulled this team together because early in the year, last year, they were talking about firing him. Even one of his owners, Eddie Einhorn, did not have complete faith in him. He had the problem. Ron LaFleur, what to do with him in spring training. He decided to release him. Disagreements with Fisk, Pacharek, a shoddy defense on the left side, and it was that man who pulled this White Sox team together. Rookie of the year in 82, maybe MVP in his sophomore season, Cal Ripken Jr. His father, of course, the third base coach. There's an idea of Jim McKean strike zone. That ball, there's Cal Sr as a younger son in the Orioles organization. But if these two pitchers get that outside part of the plate plus a little more, they can be unhittable. One and one to Ripken. He's among the league leaders in almost every important statistical category. That's just one of them. He also led in doubles, runs scored, and was just one behind Jim Rice in total bases. One. one and two. 
That center field camera is such a great shot to show how punch Fisk sets up for Hoyt. You do it differently for Dotson and Floyd Bannister, more power pitchers. But he'll move to the outside corner, and he has a way of catching pitches to deceive umpires. He has a long... There he comes inside. But he has a very long glove, a hinged glove. And many times he'll catch a pitch on the outside corner, and he'll have that glove tilted so that he will steal pitches for his pitchers. A man who some felt with a struggling start hitting and defensively early this year, they thought he might be washed up. But he has had something to prove. See how he holds that glove sideways? Very deceptive for an umpire standing behind that glove. Hoyt comes back with the 2-2. Full count to Ripken. If there has been a problem these two control pitchers have had during this season, Hoyt and McGregor, let's see how many he's walked in the last 19 starts. Hoyt has allowed 27 home runs, McGregor 24. Usually with nobody out, though. Off-speed pitch, hit to third, where Vance Law fields. Both clubs have gone down in order in the first. No score after one in Baltimore, and we're coming back right after this. The view from the Goodyear blimp, the dimensions have been changed from time to time here at Memorial Stadium. At present, 309 down both lines, short distance, 376 into the power alleys, and 405 to straightaway center. They put that burlap back there, and in addition, they have the very full trees out beyond the barrier that gets in the way of a row of white houses in deep center field, which used to be quite a disadvantage for the hitters. Luzinski fouling the first one away. Now the view here is good. Good hitting background. Heard Joe and Ben last night in the National League game. Phillies won. Dodgers nothing. Talk about the background in the bright, sunny California sky. Here it is a little cloudy now today, although the sun is peeping in and out, and the Oriole hitters requested that little piece of burlap behind there so that it would not reflect. Luzinski pops it up. Looks like it's playable for Murray. Now he stumbles, and it could be trouble. It drops. Luzinski heading for two, and he's there. The win factor does not seem too important. Remember Dan Ford for a power hitter, basically pull hitter like Luzinski was playing deep toward right center field. And Eddie Murray, who was excellent, started back. Usually a second baseman has a better chance, but Dower was playing up the middle, and then the wind got it. Murray starts looking for help. The wind keeps pushing it farther away, high up in the air. The wind is gusting out to right field. So the defensive alignment on Lezinski swung over to the left. I'll tell you, there's a... When Cal Ripken Jr. let Lezinski get between him and the ball, it may have cost him the out, because that is a pretty good throw. Look where Cal is. If he's on the other side of Lezinski, where he gets the throw, and he can snap the tag down, he might have had him. Good base running by the ball. Ball one high to Kittle, who brings some impressive numbers and a ready smile into postseason play. In the space of one year, he's already a Chicago legend. He's got kind of a Cinderella baseball story. Very affable young man. And he became this year only the 11th rookie in baseball history to top 30 home runs. He whacked 35. The rookie record is 38. Shared by Wally Berger of the Boston Braves, who did it in 1930, and Frank Robinson, who equaled it in 1956 for the Reds. Kittle's first two swings may have been a little bit inhibited. He's basically a pull hitter, although he can drive the ball to the right center field. But he added his mind with no outs, even though he's a slugger. First two pitches go the opposite way. He tried it again, but McGregor pulled the string. Charlie Lau, the great hitting coach for this White Sox team, formerly with Kansas City, the Yankees, he has a field in Florida, the only field I know of in Major League Baseball that he calls a situational hitting field, where they practice these things all spring training and carry it over during the regular season. One-two delivery, struck him out. Kittle fanned 150 times this year, and he jokes, I swing at everything, that way they never find out my weakness. But McGregor figured him out that time. McGregor had set him up with a couple of good change-ups, and then he ran a fastball away that he turned over just a little bit, ran it away from me, tried to pull it. And right here, right back in his home state, it was discovered by Bob Winsky and Bill Beck. Tap foul by Baines. Baines was a 12-year-old little leaguer when they first spotted him. Beck remembered him 
and in the 1977 draft took him ahead of such talents as Paul Molitor and Terry Kennedy's from Maryland's Eastern Shore plenty of friends and relatives at the ballpark today he hit well in September the change has popped up Dower wants it and has it the Oriole organization has a great philosophy on teaching young pitchers Dower rarely misses a ground ball. His range Batting has been telling that with some late problems in the last couple of years. Five, the first thing ben, they do with Oriole pitchers wow. in the minor leagues, there's Jimmy Williams, Canadian born, setting the defensive alignment for Joel Tabelli. But they teach pitchers in the minor leagues how to change speeds on all their pitches. Vance Law has been nursing some bruised ribs, but he says he's okay now. Turn 27 on the regular season's last day. One call. He is, of course, the son of the former Cy Young Award winner, Vernon Law of the Pittsburgh Pirates, and began his pro career in the Pirate organization until he was dealt to the White Sox. Interesting to see, excuse me, Bob, how the bottom six hitters in the lineup today, Law, Fletcher, Julio Cruz, the other hand, Dower, Todd Cruz, and Dempsey for the Orioles. Both managers pitch it in the middle of the ball game quite early with minute scoring position, fourth, fifth, even sixth innings to see if they do it uh, today. A pop off the bat of Law, and this one is taken by Ford along the right field line. So the inning opens with a bloop double from Luzinski, but he's stranded at second base as McGregor retires Kittle, Baines, and Law to end the frame. Well, in Hoyt and Luzinski, the White Sox do have some beefy players. They're not concerned about Hoyt at his age and Herb Schneider, the White Sox trainer, and some of the management people, Dave Duncan, the pitching coach, think that it might affect him as he gets up in age. His legs start weakening a little bit. This man is an absolute terror during his career in September and early October. He's hit better than 340 in September over the last four years. Who's going to be the MVP? Ripken, Murray? Maybe a guy like Rice of the Red Sox who had MVP numbers on a non-contending team. There's the win that blew a couple of balls out to right field that Eddie Murray had some problems with. It is blowing out to right field and starting to pick up. It will help him if he gets the ball into right field. Hit hard, but Cruz, who has great range, backhands and throws him out by plenty. Julio Cruz, being in the center of the diamond, has great instincts off the bat. Sometimes I wonder if it can be taught to a middle infielder. It was an off-speed pitch, a, a pitch that a second baseman with a left-handed hitter up would generally tend to shade to the hole toward first base, but he reacted to the angle off the bat and went to his right very well. And now Lowenstein. Strike one to him. If you combine the production, there's Lowenstein individually. Of Baltimore's left fielders for the year, you get a composite 291 average, 35 homers, and 130 runs driven home. So if that was one person, Baltimore's left fielder would be an MVP candidate. Lowenstein, at one time with Cleveland, was not known as a power hitter. Not that he's a slugger now, but he just took the ball the opposite way. He went into a very intensive training program, aerobics, Weightlifting, he's built up his upper body and he can turn on inside pitches and give you some problems. Tony LaRussa celebrated his 39th birthday yesterday. Now that Renee Latchman has been signed by the Brewers and returns to the managerial ranks, LaRussa no longer the youngest pilot. Pachorek at first base will outrun Lowenstein to the bag. Routing six. The designated so Four of the five outs have been ground ball outs. He can sink the fastball. Something he does well, the left-handers, is he not only throws that backdoor curveball to catch the outside corner, he can sink the fastball, and when you start leaning over the plate, he takes a cut fastball, pulls it off center a little bit, runs it under the fist with left-handed hitters. He can jam you once in a while. Ken Singleton did well against White Sox pitching this year at 342 with a couple of homers. speed pitch for a ball the feeling in the Baltimore camp was that by hitting him sixth instead of fifth where he began the year since Singleton is a switch hitter 
the platoon players, Renicky and Lowenstein in the fifth spot, would see better pitches. Hits slowly toward Pachorek. Hoyt covers, and for the second straight inning, Hoyt sets the Orioles down in order. No score at the end of two in Baltimore, and we'll be right back after these messages from your local station. The Goodyear Blimp America from Houston, Texas, at the control senior pilot Larry Chambers, and Ron Gordon is our cameraman up there. Nice job, fellas. The shortstop, number one, Scott Fletcher. Shortstop, quite a story for the White Sox this year. Last season, they made more errors than any team in the American League with the exception of Oakland. And the left side of their infield was a shambles through the first 40 games of 1983, which saw them go 16 and 24. But then, in tandem, Jerry Dibzinski and Scott Fletcher helped to stabilize the left side of that infield. Fletcher swings on the first one, and Ripken flags it down. Switched from third base a year ago, Ripken was adequate in 1982 and has developed so quickly at shortstop that he handled more chances there than any other player in the American League. Batting night. He didn't miss it any all year long. Number 16. He has helped him with that glove and a former shortstop, Todd Cruz. Ripken, who goes better to his left, had to protect that last year and play more in the hole to his right. But when they got Cruz, who also has range to his left, Ripken could go more up the center of the diamond. Cruz is in tight now in case of a bunt. Up speed pitch for a strike. You would think Julio Cruz would be an ideal leadoff man, but he suffers from such anxiety and is so uncomfortable when given that assignment that he is asked to bat ninth. One and one in the American League anyway with a designated hitter. Many managers have now taken to using the ninth spot almost like a second leadoff spot. So you've got two speedsters now batting back to back once you get through the lineup once. Todd Cruz. Throws out Julio Cruz. Almost overran that ball. Now when you're hitting against a guy like that man right there, Scott McGregor, if you're a right-handed hitter, you can. At the time, and most teams in the major leagues have some good power hitters on them. So I think it's just going to basically be the same game plan I always use. Uh, most important for me is not to walk a lot of people and keep the fast guys off the base. And that way, if Lazinski gets a home run, it's only a solo. McGregor usually does not go a lot by scouting reports. He pitches his own game. He runs the fastball away, tries to change speeds, throw it away, curveball to right-handers, keep it away back door. Once in a while, he'll try and jam a guy inside with a fastball. Ball one to Rudy Law. Here are the two speedsters back-to-back -back that he was worried about. Julio Cruz, who stole 57. And now Rudy Law, whose 77 steals are a White Sox record. And second in the American League this year behind Ricky Henderson's 108. That's what happens to you. if you go up looking for uh, breaking balls, which McGregor is. He'll throw a fastball almost right down the middle, and he'll surprise you. How hard your throw is relative. That great change he has makes that fastball but sometimes overpowering. He'll throw it by you. People have been concerned about Scotty McGregor's inning buildup. He's pitched 260 innings this year, most in his major league career. He's had arm problems a lot. Brody Law sneaks this one through the middle, just got under McGregor's glove. Now we'll see if the speed becomes a factor. Davey Nelson, who has taken films of all pitchers in the American League, he's a first base coach. He has studied the films. He knows that McGregor is very deceptive because he throws across his body many times, decoys you into going back. Now Nelson will have a conference at first base with Law to go over what they said is their game plan. What they're going to try and do is take a little shorter lead. They're going to decoy a lot like they're running and try and pull infielders out of position. Get Ripken to shade the middle of the diamond. Get Dower to shade the middle. Force Eddie Murray to hold a little bit longer. That's what they're talking about. Try and put in the heads of this Oriole team the threat of a steal. Fisk lined hard to Cruz at third his first time. Not going and lined into center field and it drops in front of Bumbry. Law will stop at second base, two on with two out. That's the third White Sox hit off McGregor. If that man, Carlton Fisk, had been a selfish hitter this year, he might he, had, uh, he might have been a uh, 100 RBI man and a 300 hitter. But he gave himself up a lot to advance runners. He took a lot of pitches so guys could steal. On the other hand, he probably saw an awful lot of fastballs with 
Oh. Cruz and Rudy Law on base ahead of him. No question. It works both ways. You help that base dealer. The base dealer by going might get you a few more fastballs. They're the two runners. Two outs. Strike one swinging to the Chorik. The arms in the outfield. Bumbry in center very weak. Lowenstein average in left. Ford strong but erratic in right. Earl Weaver had a theory in this ballpark because of the short lines. You see the shot of the ballpark to bunch everybody up the middle to protect the alleys right and left center field also to play deep concede the single but we don't want balls in over your head well weaver of course an advocate of the big inning theory his statistics showed that in about half of all games played the winning team scores more runs in a single inning a big inning than the losing team scores in the entire game so he'll concede you one and never play for one himself Pitching, fundamentals, and three-run homers. That was Earl's gospel, and Joe Aldebelli pretty much has followed up on it. The chart ahead in the count, two and one. What will McGregor go to? Many times he goes off speed. With fastball. Now three and one to Pachorek with Luzinski on deck. Short hop him and get by. Law is going to score as Ripken picks it up on the outfield grass. And it's 1 0 Chicago. That ball just ate Todd Cruz up. In between hop. Almost took his wrist off. Look how far off the line he's playing. All he can do is try and smother it. And it's a very good Ray. infield. Pat Santarone, the game. groundskeeper, and even though there have been four football games played on this field, has had it in very good shape. That ball would have had to catch him. The way it was hit. He tried to smother it, but a very, very aggressive third base coach, Jim Leland, had Rudy Law going. It is ruled a base hit by the official scorers Dave Nightingale of the Sporting News and Neil Eskridge, a retired Baltimore baseball writer. Some of the fans didn't agree. They booed Cruz. So after two are out, singles by Law and Fisk, and then Pachorek produce a run. Last few outings, Scotty McGregor has had his stuff up. Some theorize that maybe the abundance of innings he pitched, becoming the ace of this staff, hurt him. Luzinski didn't get it. He had the pitch he wanted, but didn't get all of it. Lowenstein takes it. But on three singles, the White Sox break through. Here's Rudy Law rounding third as Cruz couldn't handle the smash by Pachorek. He scores, and that's the way it stands. 1-0 White Sox history this year and these fans had plenty of reason to smile it wasn't long ago when an excellent Baltimore team had trouble drawing people less than a million some years while they were winning pennants but this year they like the White Sox drew over two million in fact all four teams involved in the playoffs on NBC Phillies and Dodgers included top the two million mark Dodgers over three million I think a lot of that is winning a lot more is has to do with franchise players like Murray and Ripken who are going to be around a long time Edward Bennett Williams the famous trial lawyer the owner of this ball club has added more spice to the franchise great continuity in this organization curveball swung on and missed by Dower the Orioles haven't had a base runner against Hoyt who has been given a one nothing lead here as he works in the last half of the third Two quick strikes. Hoyt has shown just enough of his hard stuff today. He did it to Ford early when he struck him out through two hard fastballs. He threw one up and in to Murray to move him off the plate so that they can't just sit on his off speed stuff. The curveball and the slider. Change up. Vance Law dives, takes it, and throws him out. That play is absolutely marvelous. Say the pioneers really in playing off the line in the American League. Of course, Brooks Robinson did it so well. The third baseman. Buddy Bell does it more than anybody. They've cut this down. He hurt his right shoulder, Vance Law, did early this year, and he was out quite a while because he was practicing, diving for balls like that in practice. He jammed his shoulder and had to be sat down. So the practice on that particular play paid off. After being purchased from Seattle, Todd Cruz, in his Baltimore debut, had six RBIs, a three-run homer, and a bases-loaded double in the game against Detroit. But since then, He's really struggled offensively. Strike one. 
Todd Cruz, formerly with the, formerly with the White Sox organization, the minor leagues up in Edmonton. He got in some trouble up there. And they got rid of him. Spent the time with Seattle, along with Julio Cruz, the middle of the infield. They all but released him, and look at how he's hooked up. Todd and Julio are not related. Off-speed pitches lined into center field, and Rudy Law will play it on a bounce. That's the first Baltimore base hit. So Cruz gets back in the good graces of Oriole fans to a certain extent with that one-out single. High breaking ball, and he got off point, tried to pull the stray, but it just stayed on the flat plane, out over the plate in his eyes. Dempsey not as good a hitter as the other catcher Joe Nolan and usually against a right hander Nolan would start but Dempsey is perhaps the American League's best at throwing out would be base stealers and since that's part of the White Sox plan with Julio Cruz and Rudy Law Joe Aldebelli is starting Dempsey not much speed about average speed for Todd Cruz but with one out Altabelli may decide to start a runner because Dempsey is basically a pull hitter, but they want to stay out of a double play. He may shoot the ball the other way and they may start him. We'll see. Not going and taken high, 2 0. Both catchers in this series, Fisk and Dempsey, excellent hit and run men, which is not usual for a catcher, but they're both very good at it. You mentioned Dempsey being one of the best throwers in the American League. Man catching, his throwing has improved tremendously this year. Bob Boone from California, Lance Paris is an absolute god the Tigers. Two and one. Hoyt goes hard slider, right on the outside corner, almost down the black, two balls and one strike. He has a very, very smooth delivery. You will see that he pitches from the first base side of the rubber. When he runs that fastball away from left-handers, he seems he has a better angle. Nothing White Sox. He's going. It's hit the opposite way on the attempted hit and run, but foul. Not going this time, and the breaking ball is hit hard to left field, but Kittle closes ground and has it. Cruz retreats to first with two out now, and Hoyt will face Bumbrey. Center fielder, Al Bumbrey. Made a prediction on this, or are you going out on the limb? I, it's nice to be wrong once in a while, isn't it? We ought to try it. I really feel that over the long haul, the Orioles, because they use their entire system, four pitchers called up from the Rochester franchise to help a pitching staff that was hurt over the 162 game schedule. I think the Orioles are a better team. However, I think in this short series, the White Sox are going to win it. Raisin prediction. You look at me. So funny. <laughs> <laughs> the White Sox pitching, the starting staff has been so overpowering for over three months. When you look at the combined records of Hoyt, Dotson, Bannister, to a lesser extent Burns, since midseason, they've been all but untouchable. The only mitigating factor, most of that against the American League West, notoriously weak. They won it by 20 games, equaling the largest division winning margin in baseball history. But no other team in the American League West played even close to 500 ball. The first time that's ever happened, where the division winner was the only 500 team. Against the East, the White Sox were slightly better than 500 for the season. And the American League plays the so-called balanced schedule. So essentially, the Orioles and the White Sox played the same teams from each division roughly the same number of times. Two and one to Bumbrey. Well, with two outs, do you take a chance again? Starting to rain. See what Alta Belly wants. The umbrellas start going up. They predicted 40% chance of rain earlier. Then they got the 70%. But the weather's unpredictable in this Bay Area. This ball is lofted into left center field with Rudy Law in pursuit. It's really carrying the wind, blowing it away from him, but Law runs it down. That was not hit all that hard, but it carried all the way to the track. 
before Law took it at the end of three. One run on four hits and no errors for the White Sox. 0-1-0 for the Orioles. Well, we're ready now for the Chicago half of the fourth inning. Scott McGregor will be facing Ron Kittle, Harold Baines, and uh, Vance Law. And this tells you what is going on at the stadium right now. It's a very light rain. As a matter of fact, hasn't yet begun to discolor the skin portion of the infield. White Sox, as I mentioned, really a turnaround team. Uh, they won 99 ball games, but on May the 26th of this year, the Chicago Ball Club had a record of 16 wins and 24 losses in sixth place. Now that is a turnaround. Ron Kittle and McGregor struck him out on the second. Yeah, Brooks. I was going to say, even later than that, they were 40 and 37, Chuck. There you and, go. Uh, in September this year, they went 22 and 6. So they've been playing as well as anyone in the game of baseball. In fact, they won more games than anybody in the major league. Didn't they? 99 victories. I'll tell you, Maybe. anybody that can win 99 games has played a lot of outstanding baseball. This will be a foul ball. McGregor going to make sure it stays there. They went on a 10 day road trip at the end of the year and they needed nine out of 10 for 100. They won eight out of 10 for 99. 50 home runs at Edmonton. His career was all but washed up. Released by the Dodgers when he had neck problems, vertebrae trouble. Quite a story. 1-1, one, 1-2. One. One it was Billy Pierce who spotted him, wasn't it? Yeah. He had numbness in his hands, had the Spinal column surgery. Billy Pierce saw him playing in Gary, Indiana, suburb of Chicago. Sandlot ball told Bill Beck, said, this kid can hit. So a link between the 1959 champions and the 83 division titleists. Pierce, of course, a member of the pennant winners in 59. Kittle is a strikeout victim for the second straight time. That's the first hard breaking ball that Scotty McGregor has thrown in this ball game. Yet right Kittle there, leaning man. over the plate. He busted a slider Bang. down and in. Show you the amazing control. He hadn't shown this pitch to any White Sox hitters, and there it is. Slider or a cut fastball freezes him. They think the success of his year this year has been able to throw that hard slider on occasion. Strike one to Baines as we pause briefly for station identification on the NBC television network. WMAQ TV Chicago. One and one to Harold Baines, Bob Costas, Tony Kubek in Baltimore where it's drizzling. We're in the top half of the fourth. The White Sox on a third inning run lead it one to nothing. You know, you talked about all the innings that McGregor pitched this year, some 260. But one thing, he does pitch low count games. He had a 10 inning complete game victory over Milwaukee, for example, where he threw just 97 pitches. On the change, it's grounded up the middle. Dower backhands and on the wall. says that with McGregor who is so consistent in hitting the catcher's glove that he's able to cheat on pitches more than with any other pitcher and he was in motion toward the middle when Baines hit this one. There was an example from that center field the camera. He went hard slider or cut fastball away. Dower saw the location in the strike zone knew he could lean to the middle of the diamond. You'll just see more good plays behind control pitchers than power pitchers as the infielders are more alert. Vance Law takes a strike. It's this one hard and Ripken leads to Spirit. Back to back defensive gems by the middle of the ball. Sox go down in order in the fourth. Attention, please. So pretty after three and a half. The, Orioles, the White Sox won. And Baltimore up. Can receive information and order. It's pouring now at Memorial Stadium, and the tarp is going on the field. If we resume, the White Sox will have a one-nothing lead, build on a two-out rally in the third, when Rudy Law singled to center. Fisk blooped one into center field, and then Tom Pachorek ripped one right at third baseman Todd Cruz, but it handcuffed him, was ruled a hit as it bounced into left, and Law scored. 
That's the only scoring in the game. Obviously, if the rain does not relent, this is not an official game. We start from scratch tomorrow, and Hoyt and McGregor would be scratched in that case. Very interesting. But they will do everything in their power and wait as long as possible to try and resume it. After the fourth inning, they're behind one to nothing. They've had one base hit. Todd Cruz, single to center field. Dan Ford leading off the bottom of the fourth. The rain delay was 42 minutes. And Ford leads off the last half of the fourth. He takes a strike. Did not work out well for Baltimore last year when they sent Doug DeSensei to California for Dan Ford. The Angels definitely got the best of it. Ford will sink the fastball. That's what you just saw. Running it on the fist of right-handers. Cut the fastball. Slider changes speeds on that curveball. So you talk about Lamar Hoyt and Scotty McGregor. You're talking about guys that have 10, 12 different pitches. It's slowly towards second. Cruises up with it, has time, and retires Ford. Something we saw him early in this ball game go nearly behind second base on a one hopper. This time he goes right in the area of Pachari. What a relief for a first baseman to have a guy with that range. What we are seeing here in the early years of Cal Ripken Jr.'s career, unless every baseball man misses his guess, are the early chapters in a storybook career and the final pages probably will be written sometime from now at Cooperstown. 318, 27 homers, 102 RBIs for the season. Swings and misses. Here's a guy that has increased his average from last year as Pops looks on from third base of almost 40 points. And coincidental or not, he showed how tough he was. He was involved in a very severe beating. His father said that he was scared more than ever before in his life. He came back even stronger. He's driving that ball to right field better than ever. A lot of his doubles go that way out the right center. Hoyt gets ahead of him quickly, 0-2. There's another Ripken in the Orioles system in Class A ball, 18-year-old infielder Billy. The Ripken in the infield to pull Fletcher slightly in the hole at short. He fans him on three pitches. So Hoyt looks sharp after the rain delay of just over 40 minutes. We mentioned Hoyt's record of 24 and 10, but try this on for size. Since the All-Star break, the Sox trio of Hoyt, Bannister, and Dotson, a combined record of 42 and 5. So now the cleanup man, Eddie Murray, with two outs and nobody aboard, last half of the fourth, 1-0 Chicago. We asked Lamar Hoyt what he's going to be trying to do and how he'll operate on Eddie Murray. Well, basically, Eddie Murray is a, is a give-and-take type hitter. He's going to go up there, and he's going to be uh, looking for a particular pitch. If, I, if I'm smart enough and uh, on my toes, I can pick up what he's looking for and uh, throw something else, hopefully. That is something I've never really believed when pitchers say that, the instinct. And I've heard Whitey Ford talk about it, Eddie Lopat years ago. McGregor talked about it yesterday as did Hoyt, that they can get poised on that back foot a second or two from their release point they can see something in a hitter that will make them change their pattern it sounds impossible but it's instinctive a ball and two strikes to murray you want to talk about power hitting consistency in his last three complete seasons discounting the strike year of 81 he's hit 32 32 and then this year 33 home runs his rbi figures 116 110 111 this year again the 2-2 two -two. Pachorek bobbles it, but has time to flip to Hoyt. So through the first four innings, the Orioles have managed just one base runner against Hoyt, who leads it one to nothing and will return to Memorial Stadium in a minute. It's the top of the fifth inning. The Memorial Stadium first game of the American League Championship Series. Sox leading one to nothing. Sox with a run on four hits. Orioles no runs on one hit. And as we mentioned last inning, Scotty McGregor was down in the Baltimore bullpen. He was warming up. As you look at right-hander Sammy Lee Stewart. 
Tar Heel out of North Carolina just in case things do not go as manager Joe Aldebelli had hoped for or planned. And in case you just tuned in we mentioned earlier that we have reports that McGregor has indeed a very very tired left shoulder. It is not sore. It is not hurting. It is just tired. And he has evidence that this, uh, he is not throwing the way that we have seen Scotty McGregor throw in the past. So he'll complete his warm-up tosses, and here in the top of the fifth, it'll be Scott Fletcher, the Juice, Julio Cruz, and Rudy Law. The skipper looking on, and he celebrated his 39th birthday yesterday. And he says that's all for him. No more. So here's Scotty. Scotty 0 for 1, hit a little looper to Ripken back in the third. This year hit at 273 against Baltimore pitching. Knocked in three runs. Outfield deep for Scotty. Fastball outside. Now he hit that home run up in Seattle. Bill Whirl was there, their super scout. <laughs> he might have put the word out. That's down. Nice play by Todd Cruz on the short hop. Low throw to Murray. He digs it out, and there's one gone. Nice play by Cruz. Well, he just has a do or die play. Couldn't go too much further. He comes up with it. Now, just about throws it away from Murray. Eddie makes a good play. One gone, and here's. Julio Cruz juice bounced out five to three in the third. And they're playing him to pull. There's that slow curveball flipped up there by McGregor. Once again down to Cruz has an easy play this time. Two gone. So the same scenario as what happened in the third inning after Fletcher and Cruz had gone out. Rudy Law single, Fisk single, and then Pashurik single for the only run of the game. Rudy won for two. A little looper, that's going to fall for a base hit as Dan Ford comes in. So the same thing in the second verse starting here in the fifth. And right here is where the Sox have a definite advantage over the Orioles. They can indeed, as you look at Davey Nelson, who has been very instrumental in the success of the Sox base runners this year, they can manufacture a run. Here's Carlton Fisk. He's one for two. He's lined hard to cruise at third. Then he hit that semi line drive single up the middle off a fastball from McGregor. That was in the third. Rudy with a good lead as Murray comes off. Murray is pulling the decoy over there. He comes off that bag very quickly, as you'll see the split screen right here. And then he'll give a sign to McGregor, and he will break back. And if you are not on your toes, you are out. Boy, the Orioles worked that play well. All the infield plays, all the pickoff plays, all the hold them on plays, they've got them. Now Rudy with a little bigger lead as Murray comes off. As Carlton takes the strike and the count one and one. That's Cruz on the short hop. Another nice play. He'll take the short way over to Dyer. Forces Law and that'll retire the side. So nothing across for the Sox. There was a hit. No errors. One man left. And after four and a half, it's one nothing White Sox. Bob Costas and Tony Kubek back in Baltimore. Lowenstein, Singleton, and Dower to face Hoyt in the Oriole fifth. Lowenstein 0 for 1, grounded to first. His only time at bat. Takes ball one. Second and third times around against Lamar Hoyt. Fisk will look at the stances of hitters to see if they've moved up on the plate, and Hoyt will adjust accordingly. Here's that backdoor curveball. Pod just sets up on the outside corner and swoops around the plate. Lowenstein at 36 years of age. 
probably the flakiest of the Orioles, although Rick Dempsey could probably give him a run for his money. Off the fists, Baines comes in after starting back and takes it. He jammed him. He threw a fastball inside that hit him on the fists. Fell in right field, Harold Baines, as good as anybody in the American League, going into that right field corner and digging a ball out and throwing it out at second base. Goldstein keep that head down and try and get extension, but the ball got a little in on him. Lamar Hoyt, just a throw in in the deal in 1977, which sent Bucky Dent from the White Sox to the Yankees in exchange for Oscar Gamble. At that time, Hoyt was a minor leaguer. He labored eight years in the minors before making the big show. Singleton hits his first pitch into right center field. A high oh. hop over Law's head, and it goes to the wall. Singleton doesn't run well, content with a double. good speed to cut down the gap but to give you an idea of the kind of athlete Harold Baines is Singleton is being played by Baines in right field slightly to pull when this took this funny hop over the head of Rudy Law look who's there to back it up Harold Baines saves a triple he came a long way to cut that alley off so now Dower has a chance to tie the game strike one swinging Sox third baseman Vance Law in the third. He had a pretty decent September. He got his back going a little bit. He's already. Hoyt looks singled in back and throws Dower out. Despite his size, Hoyt is a fairly nimble fielder. of the 13 outs registered by Hoyt so far in this ball game have been ground ball outs. Two have been strikeouts. And as his pattern has been all season long, he has not yet walked the hitter. Todd Cruz is one for one. Oh and one. Ralph Rowe, the Orioles hitting instructor, Still sees the potential of maybe a 250 hitter in Cruz with a little bit of power. He's worked with him almost daily since they've got him. A lot of extra hours. Ralph Rowe with the hand on his chin. A one pitch, chopped to short. Fletcher. They're out of the inning. No runs ahead, a one-out double by Singleton, but he's left stranded. We've completed five, and it's still 1-0 Chicago. In Baltimore, and the White Sox behind Lamar Hoyt, leading Scott McGregor and the Orioles 1-0, as Tom Pachorek leads it off. Pachorek has the game's only RBI. Takes ball one. The number 44 on his back is his old football uniform from his college days. He was an honorable mention All-American defensive back at Houston in the late 1960s, taken in the ninth round of the then AFL draft by the Miami Dolphins in 1968. You know, Tony, Joe Aldabelli made the point that with the left-hander on the mound, and so many right-handed bats in the Chicago lineup, he wanted Todd Cruz at third base. In the last inning, Cruz got all three assists. Mm -hmm. It's interesting also, during the pennant stretch, Glenn Gulliver, another guy who's not eligible, left-handed hitter who Earl Weaver used last year, got a lot of base on balls, played 11 consecutive games to add offense to the lineup. He's not available now, and Cruz needed for his defense. 3-1 pitch to Pachorek. Taken high and away, that's the first walk issued by either pitcher. Scotty McGregor wants to know what? Was it high? He asked Jim McKeon, up in the strike zone. Last inning, the bullpen was up. This inning, it was not up. Right now, Sammy Stewart with his first warm-up toss. 
Dennis Martin is in the background, who's had a rough, rough season. Ali Hendricks, the bullpen coach. Here's the bull who had a bloop double to right and then fly to left. Now back, strike one. 0 oh and 2. Interesting swing by the bull. He got a tailing fastball away, and he looked like he was trying to shoot it between Dower, who's playing up the middle, and Murray holding Pacharek. That's part of that situation hitting. Even with a slugger like Lazinski, that Charlie Lau wants him to do once in a while. He wants him to make outs that are meaningful to advance base runners. You see why Scotty McGregor's motion is deceptive? You're on first base on the other side of that replay. It looks like he's coming right your way. Two and two now to Luzinski, who is one of six White Sox with postseason experience. Pachorek is one, Kuzman, Tidro, Fisk, and Aurelio Rodriguez. And in four LCS competitions with the Phillies, he had five home runs and had a batting average of 310. Murray can't oh handle my. it. Pachorek rounds second and is heading for third as Dower has no play. Runners at the corners with nobody out. You won't see that man do that often, if ever. It looked like the grass slowed this ball down and it fooled Eddie. Watch you put the glove down and the grass slows it down and he just goes right underneath his glove and they first and third him with nobody out. Nelson now alerting Lazinski to what he has picked up. Not for a steal, but so that he gets a decent jump with a chance to break up a double play. It's ruled an error on Eddie Murray. So a walk and an error have put runners at first and third with nobody out on the top half of the sixth. Kittle. It could be two, but a run will score even if they turn it. 6-4-3, and Pachorek crosses the plate. Grass appears to be slowing the ball down quite a bit, doesn't it? On the one hand... McGregor's defense has helped him out on several occasions. Todd Cruz has turned in two fine plays, and Dower and Ripken each robbed White Sox batters of hits. On the other hand, both runs can be attributed to somewhat faulty defense. Cruz unable to handle Pachorek's ball in the third, and then Murray's error leading to a run here in the sixth. Errol Bain just had a pitch in his wheelhouse. Fastball that he might have been sitting on, which is unusual to do with McGregor, and he just fouled it back. He is it left-hander so much better this season. 0-2. Oh so McGregor says, you want to go at a high fastball, I'll go six inches higher. Baines had 22 game-winning RBIs this year. Tops in the majors. Gets under this one and pops it foul with Murray in pursuit. Has it. On a walk, an error, and a double play grounder, which produced a run. The White Sox add another, lead 2-0 after five and a half. Now you're looking at the man of the hour, insofar as Chicago is concerned. Their brilliant right-hander, Lamar Hoyt. The regular season, he won 24, lost 10. As a lock, uh, as the Cy Young Award winner this year, and uh, those of you watching the telecast this afternoon see how he is able to get himself in that position. He just won whale of the pitcher. He hasn't walked the batter through the first five. He struck out two. There have only been one, two, three, four balls hit out of the infield all afternoon against Hoyt. Two nothing the White Sox as Dempsey takes a strike here in the sixth inning. You give Hoyt a two nothing lead going into the late innings. And I'll tell you, you are in serious difficulty. Dempsey really waited. That's a good piece of hitting on the part of Rick Dempsey. And it'll bring up Al Bumbry, who has grounded the second and fly to center. Jim Kern in the spring training blew his arm out. He was throwing very well. La Russa had to go to more people and spread the saves out. I don't think it's weak. I just don't think there's one man who's concentrating and being in the save situation. It's been a bullpen by committee, but if you add up all the saves, they're up there among the league leaders. That's only the third hit off point. Bumbry's 0 for 2. 
Strike one. The Orioles led the majors and come from behind wins this year. They wound up winning 36 games during which they trailed at one time or another. Well, I think that attitude that we talked about with Eddie Murray getting to be a better hitter after he's seen pitchers off and on is true of this entire ball club. That's why a pitcher can't stay with the same pattern. He's got to change. That could be two. Yep. Cruz to Fletcher. Oh, oh the throw really conked Dempsey. Don't know if the helmet was on or not, but he went into the slide. The body was high, and Julio came from down under. He may have hit his hand, may have protected his face. I think he just thrust his hand up there in time. Boy, an anxious moment there. Ralph Salvan out, the trainer. We'll show it from our left center field camera. Dempsey, with the ball hit rather sharply, McGregor comes from down under. Hit the helmet. Edge of the helmet and the right hand. Tony La Russa now is going to come out and try and make a point with the second base umpire. As we look at this replay again, he's being booed because he is going to talk to Nick Bremick and say, what is the rule? And I think the rule said that if he did that intentionally, which that did not appear to be, even though he stood high, if he had deflected the ball intentionally, they could call the runner on the other end out. Humber in this case, out making the double play automatically. But the umpires did not feel that it was intentional by Dempsey, and the replays obviously showed that. He was trying to protect himself. Reminiscent of the play in the 1934 World Series between the Cardinals and the Tigers, before the days of helmets, we'll watch it again. Dempsey coming straight in toward the bag and conk on the throw from Fletcher. Dizzy Dean was coming into second on that occasion and was not cold by a throw like this. Watch the right hand. He just got down too late, and then when he saw Fletcher really roaring across the bag, he couldn't get down in time. But if it hit the right hand, Dempsey, if there's any after effects, any swelling, any puffiness, any numbness, it might help the uh, running game for the White Sox further. But we'll see as the series progresses. Bumbrey is at first now. He's stolen 12 this year. Hoyt chasing him back. After Dean was conked by that Tiger throw many years ago, the next day in the Detroit papers, the headline said, X-rays of Dean's head reveal nothing. <laughs> that windmill motion by Bumbrey at first was to tell Cal Ripken, start the series of signs over. Off-speed pitch fouled back. Got away with a hanging breaking ball. Ralph Salva with Scotty McGregor. Around Dempsey getting the ice on that is the right throwing hand. Seeing if he can feel the ball. All the players, and I guess pitcher would be first, but if there's ever a critical injury, you won't want it to happen to a catcher's hand. The 0-1, 1-1. One, one and one. To right field, down the line, foul. Riley on the right field foul line. The umpire down there, as Bob told you earlier, in case you tuned in late, six in the league championship series. Merit system, the second year in a row where they are not just picking umpires at random, or rather on a rotation basis, and it's upsetting to some umpires. The league offices feel that the umpires will try harder if they know there's extra money in postseason play. Bumbrey is at first with one down. Last half of the sixth. White Sox lead at 2-0. Chop towards short. Fletcher gets one to Cruz. Oh, the return. Man. What a that pivot. Two. What a great pivot by Julio Cruz. The ball was hit very slowly, and Bumbrey came in hard on Cruz, but even those two factors combined didn't stop him from completing the double play. The grass is holding the ball up, and watch Cru uh, Cruz get upset, but he got the throw off and turned it. Back after this from your local station. Well, let's watch the White Sox turn the uh, double play that ends the inning. And an excellent effort from uh, Chicago. Well, it sure was. Uh, Julio Cruz at second base knew that he was going to get taken out of that ball, out of that play, and he stood there, took what was coming to him, and turned a double play. You'll see Ford right on him, up pins him, but he makes it. Scotty was going to give it to him as quickly as possible, and that's what saved it. That's what enabled, because if he gets the ball just a split second later, he's not going to turn it. Right here to call it for you is Don. 
I can't eat. Boy, I'll tell you, that is one of the finer double plays I've ever seen. And outside 2 and 0. Oh. Law has flied to right and hit a looping line drive that Ripken made a good play off. 2 to nothing. Sox on top in the top of the seventh. Low 3 and 0. Oh. Fletcher in that on deck circle looks at the scoreboard, sees a 3 0 count, just takes a deep sigh as he walks him on four pitches. That is the second walk issued by Fletcher. And it'll bring on Fletcher. McGregor there, Sharon Law. A lot of the Sox family here, not only the official family, but the players, of course, bringing their wives. Now, Scotty Fletcher will stand in. Cruz comes up on the grass at third. Murray will be charging hard from first, and we'll get some action again in the bullpen. It had a family dog, and his name was Victor. Here's the fake. It's going to be a ball. They got their signals messed up. Eddie Murray signaled to McGregor that he was coming to charge for the buck. The communications was not there when Murray left first base open. McGregor going home. He couldn't throw the ball anywhere. He could have gone home if he had chosen to, but his mind is a little bit different. Look at this. He wants to go to first. A mess up in signals. It's a ball. Three of the four umpires I saw, that's Derwood Merrill, the first base umpire. The hand is raised, so they advance the runner without a base hit. Without losing it out, more importantly. Now Fletcher squares and drops the ball. It's a good one. McGregor goes to first, where Dower covers. But on a walk, a balk, and a sacrifice, Law is at third with one out. Situational hitting. That's what Charlie Law calls it. In fact, he's writing a book about it. Making meaningful outs. Now they will be forced to bring the infield in. Two runs down. An entire book on making meaningful outs. You bet. Well, he called it a situational hitting book. Maybe it's just going to be a pamphlet, but it's going to be a big one. <laughs> Be very aware in this situation with Cruz up, and they are. That's what Dempsey went out to tell McGregor. He'll pitch from the stretch. Good bunner right here. Russo squeezed during the course of the season. Doesn't show the bunt. Takes low for ball one. Popped foul, and the count evens at two and two. McGregor has not exactly been pounded by the White Sox. But he's in danger of going behind three to nothing here in the seventh. 2 2 pitch to Cruz with the infield in. Gets away. Law coming home and Dempsey's now. throw. Got him. Slow job as Leland yells, but Dempsey went down on his knees to block that ball. Had to get up and pounce on that ball like a cat and rifle a perfect throw to Scotty McGregor. Law may have been a little slow. He may have not have been able to find the ball. Look at McGregor straddling the plate. I'll tell you, that hand is supposed to be on the plate before he tagged him on the shoulder. But what a play by Dempsey. When very, the very ball close. first got away, Tony. Looked like no chance, didn't it? Absolutely. In your mind's eye, you've already got law scoring. It's a foregone conclusion. Cruz taps it foul. And it holds a three and two. I mean, this went almost all the way back to the screen before Dempsey got it to McGregor. Watch the hand. Is the hand on the corner? He touches him on the chest. I believe it is. He might have been called safe. I wonder if Jim McKean was not locked up, locked out on that play. You know, they're. they're it's an aggressive base running team. We've told you that. Leland wants him to go. La Russa does. Davey Nelson. But you got to sacrifice Fly with just one out that might have scored him. Although you did have Cruz up, who's not much of a power hitter. Now let's see if Cruz challenges the arm and the move of McGregor as Ray Miller, the pitching coach, comes out. There's Tony La Russa's family. His father, his mother, and his wife, Elaine. Pops Italian, mom, Spanish. Grew up in the neighborhood down in Ybor City near Tampa in Florida. Where one of his mentors was Al Lopez. Senor. Sammy Stewart up again. 
And the senior, of course, the manager the last time the White Sox captured a pennant in 1959. Ray Miller has visited McGregor with Cruz, who stole 50 cents, was balked to second, sacrificed to third. And then as the ball got away from Dempsey, appeared certain to score, but Dempsey's scrambling play and throw to McGregor erased him at the plate. Now Julio Cruz draws a two-out walk. Here's Rudy Law. Not going and hit into center field, so how do you like it? Rudy Law with his third hit. Here's Ford picking it up, and Law wants a double. High throw gets by. But there's McGregor backing it up, so the runners must stay at second and third. Hey, they have no fear of running because you've got two outs. He gets thrown out. He's got punch fist coming up. So with two outs, even at that, you might call it reckless if he had been thrown out. But the throw got away from the wet grass, overthrown second base, and two runners are in scoring position. Now you'd think that they would show a little bit more discipline on the base after just having Law thrown at home plate, but they want him to keep on going and force mistakes. And they have. So this is McGregor. And we'll get another look at Dempsey's play, which certainly made this inning a bit easier to take for the Orioles. McGregor will put the tag on Vance Law. Sammy Stewart is coming to the ball game with a 2 to nothing lead against him. We asked Ray Miller, the pitching coach, to talk about him. Uh, Sammy Stewart's a four-pitch pitcher. Uh, he's got a, a new harder curveball this year that's been very effective, especially since the All-Star break. And since the All-Star break, he's probably been the top uh, middle reliever in, in the American League for sure. Sammy Stewart, 28 years old, North Carolina native. There are his numbers. He's 6'3", 210 pounds. You know, Tony La Russa seriously considered, and who could blame him, not playing Rudy Law in this first game. After all, a left-handed pitcher going, and he's two for 36 against the Orioles. He's three for four today. He may have won himself to start Rudy gotcha. Law game number three. The philosophy that Russa had was against McGregor, because he doesn't have the good hard curve, would play him against McGregor. But Flanagan, with that good snapper, the good hard curve, he thought he might embarrass Law, but off his showing today, he'll probably start in game number three. You know, one of the things about this Orioles staff is they go right, left, right, left in their starters in this series. They've done that all year long. You go from guys with basically great off-speed stuff to power pitchers like Stewart, Stoddard, and that great hard curve from Timmy Martinez. So for a hitter, it's unusual to face so many different styles coming from so many angles. It's tough. Ball one high to Fisk, who's one for three on the afternoon. One and one to him. The radar gun here in Baltimore, which is said to be about five miles per hour shy, has had Stewart at 87 on his first two pitches. So on another gun, that might be around 90. One and two, and that one had some pop on it. That's 90 plus. When he comes in a situation like these, you heard Ray Miller say he's a four-pitch pitcher, but if he goes a little bit longer relief, he'll go to four pitches. But here he's basically hard fastball, he'll throw that hard slider. And two pitches in a situation like this, and if he's in a long haul, throw all four. Rudy Lodge second. Julio Cruz at third. Two outs in the one suit of Fisk. It holds. This one is in the dirt, blocked by Dempsey Cruz bluffs down the line but stays put there's no tougher pitch for a catch to block than that big curveball overhand curveball where that spin on the ball will bounce the opposite direction a right hander will usually bounce to catcher's left and with the experience of Dempsey he smothered it cut those shoulders and kept it near him is he hard nosed or what you oh, know he's, he's hurting him. after taking that ball off his hand and off the top of his helmet on the double play pivot a while ago. He saved them a couple of runs already in this inning to keep them close. Breaking ball for a called third strike. So for the White Sox, all kinds of base runners put nothing across. And it's still 2-0 as we go to the last half of the seventh. All right, we're up 15-0. 
15. We got this game won. Yeah, you guys are buying a light beer from Miller. Yeah. Nice, nice, Philly. One out to go. Yeah, what can he do to his mouth? Hey, I'll keep the change. Here's Rodney! Ah! inning for Baltimore you look at Squires at first base well you don't think that's a thrill for him being the senior member and times of tenure service with the White Sox though the White Sox have a two run lead you wonder if that inning might not come back to haunt them because the Orioles made some mistakes the walk first of all Fletcher did his job but there was a balk that sent him to uh, second base a walk to Cruz another mistake not usually making law not thrown out at second base by Ford but they get away without scoring any runs. And the heart of the order in the last half of the seventh. Ripken is grounded out and struck out. Strike one. For Hoyt, batting against the three, four, five, and six hitters, the power in the order for the Orioles. An important inning because if he gets him out one two three may not have to face him again in the night or the reliever may not so this is a critical inning for Lamar Hoyt the Orioles have not had an inning where they had more than one base runner against Hoyt at second base Cruz charges throws one down first baseman Eddie Murray Eddie Murray has had a tough day 0 for 2 at the plate and a couple of misadventures in the field the first really wasn't his fault as Luzinski's pop was windblown and he couldn't get to it it fell for a double then he was charged with an error in an inning in which the White Sox scored as a ball went under his glove also hit by Luzinski and he had the play at first base where McGregor was charged with a balk he swings on this one and got under it might have had a pitch he could handle but lost it to Baines in right field to Don. Count the double play in the sixth. 13 ground ball outs thrown by Lamar Hoyt in this Left ball game. John Lawrence. Ripken 0 for 3, Murray 0 for 3, Lowenstein 0 for 2, single with a double and a ground out. He's 1 for 2. That's the meat of the order, the power in this order. So the 3, 4, 5 hitters are a combined 0 for 8. One call. Point has been consistently ahead of the hitters. Point has been a pretty good finisher. He's completed 11 ball games during the course of the regular season. He was 24 and 10 for the year, and he's riding a 13-game winning streak. He won 14 in a row between 81 and 82 on another occasion. Closed 81 with five straight. Opened 82 with nine victories in a row. He's had to work to attain his present stature in the minor leagues. He was not considered a super prospect. Good Owen change Stein up off a breaking ball. Taps it foul, so it's two and two. In fact, in the minor leagues, Hoyt once endured an 11-game losing streak, had a couple of years under 500, and as we mentioned earlier, was just a throw-in in that Dent Gamble deal. What a deal for the White Sox, as it turns out. You've got to go back a ways to be able to find a pitcher who has won. 43 ball games in two years, 24 this year and 19 last year when he did not get a Cy Young Award vote, as I said. 
Is it coincidental, Tony, or are the Orioles trying to disrupt Hoyt's rhythm? Several times they have stepped out of the box today just as he was about to deliver. I don't think it bothers him. In fact, uh, punch fist many times to try and slow his pitchers down. What a pitch right there on the black. Low and outside. Lowenstein can't believe it. That's why Hoyt throws that fastball left-handers from the first base side. So it remains 2-0 White Sox. We've completed seven in Baltimore. Sammy Stewart faces Tom Pachorek and he rips the first pitch through the infield for a leadoff single in the top of the eighth. When he raised his average to two, from 240 up over 300, and somebody asked him why or how, he said, I've gone to a heavier bat. I'm not basically a pull hitter. I flatten out my swing like Rod Carew and in positive thinking through hypnotism. Hypnotist Harvey Meisel has been hired from St. Paul, Minnesota area. Work with some of these on a volunteer basis. Michael also worked with Rod Carew, Larry Boa, Bill Buckner, Don Sutton. I don't think it was Harvey Massell had some hypnotic influence during his career on the West Coast. The runner is going, but Lazinski fouls it back. How's that? You start a runner, Pacharek, with your cleanup hitter up, Lazinski. So much confidence. A strikeout pitcher, a man who strikes out in Lazinski. Unusual baseball. That's the way LaRusso wants to play it. Lazinski has opened up his stance here against Stewart ever so slightly. It's this one down the line and right and foul. Probably off a pitcher like McGregor, who was running the fastball away, change ups. He may have been trying to close his stand and keep the hips closed so that he would not get too far out in front, drive the ball up the middle. With Stewart, the fastball runs in and a hard slider away. But the Bull may feel I need to get that bat out a little quicker with more arm speed. Ray Miller now out. The Orioles' bullpen is going. Now Dempsey will join the conference. Tim Stoddard. He's the right-hander, Tippy Martinez. Some think the best left-handed short reliever in the American League. And what a job Al Holland did yesterday in relieving lefty Steve Carlton. The Phillies won a nothing win last night. Al DeBelli in touch with the bullpen, and Miller has said his piece. As we look at Luzinski up at the plate and on the other side, Ken Singleton, the DH for Baltimore. You wonder if what Miller said was, look, we know that the White Sox are trying to put a threat of, there's the full stance, of their speed, a threat of a stolen base, but the man you better worry about is the bull, Lazinski. Do not divide your attention. It's what Davey Nelson's game plan for the base runners, base dealers is. Show the threat of steals. Keep it on their minds. Big sweeping breaking ball misses. The count is full. Started to say about Lazinski and Singleton, one of these clubs, Jim Leland, the third base coach, is going to the World Series, and there will be problems getting either Lazinski or Singleton into the lineup. No DH this year in the series. Not his best move, just to find trying to find out something. Larusa has had Lazinski play some first base. He's been working out there. Singleton could play right field. Runner is going, but the pitch misses, and Lazinski draws the walk. And it sets up the situation perfectly because Kittle was in the original lineup. Squires, an excellent bunner, bat control artist, artist hitting in his spot right now. So Kittle, who's not a good bunner, he's a slugger. Squires. You might not have wanted to bunt if he had been in the lineup. He hasn't been called upon to bunt too often. Now it'll be Squires, and we may see Tippy Martinez as El Tabelli comes out. Tippy Martinez, the, uh, the man that Bob Costas told you about when he picked off those three against Toronto in one inning in August. Great curveball. Looks like he's going to him. So Stewart is leaving. Martinez is arriving and will be returning after this.
Well, that bird has little reason to smile right now. The White Sox lead it two to nothing. Tippy Martinez trying to slam the door on them, but they're threatening for more here in the top half of the eighth. Pachorek opened with a single. Lazinski on a 3-2 pitch drew a walk, so two on, nobody out, and the batter due to be Squires in a sacrifice situation. Interesting little tidbit picked up while we were in a commercial from Don Sutton, our resident pitching expert, the American League, and of course Tom Seavers over with Vince Scully and uh, Joe Gargiola in the National League, but he was talking about the reason Tippy Martinez can throw so many innings in short relief and throw that hard curveball. He has a very simple delivery. Not much wasted effort. And see also now if Mike Squires coming in and a bunt situation can bunt either that hard curveball or he'll run the fastball in on him. Tippy Martinez on the disabled list midway through the season underwent an emergency appendectomy but has returned with no ill effects. Also see if the Orioles they have three or four different plays like most major league teams in a bunt situation with no outs first and second. Sometimes the third baseman will charge sometimes the shortstop will go to third sometimes they'll work a pickoff at second. Dower sneaking back. Basic way is third baseman's got to make a big big decision whether he's going to charge go to first second. Left hander like Tippy Martinez it's easier for a left hander to come down the third baseline off the bunt because he's facing the third base Ripken coming to third. He didn't show the bunt on the first pitch ball one. And the key plays in the Oriole Pirate World Series came in this when Lowenstein was up with two men on and Tanner put a play on Foley going to third Lowenstein was hitting hit a ball right at him they turned a double play one of the plays that may have turned that series around so they can backfire. Squires in for defense but a chance to help with the bat in the eighth. Now he squares. Chops it. It's foul. Squires tried to wait as long as he could so he wouldn't tip it off. He may have waited too long and fouled it off. You want to see from the blimp exactly what happens. Martinez delivers. Look at Murray charging. Cruz waiting. This particular time. Goes to the second one. Ripken goes to second. And Dower goes to first. They may change it the next time if he's still bunting. Squire tried to conceal that bunt. Almost did, but then waited too long and fouled it off. Look at Rodriguez, who came over from the Orioles right behind La Russa, whispering in the ear of La Russa what the play situation is. He may know the signs. He's with the Orioles this year. He was picked up to be made eligible defensively. Swings Look away. Ripken fields it, gets the force. That's all. And Murray has to block it to prevent a wild throw. I'll tell you, Aurelio Rodriguez has read their signs sitting over in the White Sox dugout, and that was a pretty good play by Ripken because he was shading a little bit toward third, and he got right the center. runner at second right. base to keep a double play in order. Some shortstops not as smart as that might have gone to first. He got second and third with the infield's force to come in. Look at Ripken. He's got to reverse his field. Still has the composure. Keep a double play in order. That's pretty good baseball right there. Managers and infielders, pitchers trying to outguess each other. A little help from that man, Aurelio Rodriguez. So now runners at the corners with one out. Payne swings on the first one. Murray comes home. They've got Pachorek hung up as Dempsey runs him back to Cruz, and they got it. Like to have stayed in the rundown a little bit longer to get those runners to second and third. But look at Dempsey. One throw, got the ball in the bare hand. A great fundamental for you kids to watch. Keep faking the back to the base to which he came, and a little pop. Well, the White trouble. Sox executing fundamentals so far today. The Orioles is usually a sound fundamental team, but that was just perfect. White Sox got one in the third, another in the sixth, in the seventh and eighth. They've had base runners galore, but so far have been unable to add to the 2 0 advantage. Vance Law now with runners at first and second, and two gone. Can he hold up? They want to check it first, and they say he went around for strike one. Derwin Merrill on the appeal makes the call. He's the first base umpire. 
That is so tough to lay off with Timmy Martinez. He may have had, may have as good a curveball from a left-hander as anybody in the American League. In fact, he throws a very, very unusual one that, on occasion, Greg Nettles swears breaks two ways. He said it looks like a right-hander's curveball. Strike two call. There's Mrs. Martinez after Tippy recovered from the appendectomy in the second half of the season. He was 4-0 with 11 saves and an earned run average of 1.46. That's after the All-Star game. Foul ball, count holds 0-2. coming again wild pitch the runners will move up and be at second and third now he just tried to overthrow a fastball I, as the runners move to second and third now he's gone breaking ball consistently to law his fastball is a little sneaky when you're looking for a curveball and he may be in the high 80s I think you look overpowering this is the kind of pitch that the Orioles, this just slipped out of his hand, that the Orioles don't believe in. Ray Miller is not a big believer, as George Banger before him, that you have pitches to set up other pitches. Their philosophy is every pitch you throw is to get an out with that pitch. This one bounces in the dirt, but Dempsey is able to keep it in front of him. He thought perhaps Law had offered on it. They check with Merrill at first base, and this time he says no, so the count two and two. He's getting a workout today, isn't he, Rick Dempsey? Aside from the hand getting banged up when he was hit on the slide, Julio Cruz made a great play, saving a run to throw out Vance Law to Scotty McGregor when he pounced on one. Breaking ball pitchers like this, you'd better be ready to get down on your knees and throw your body in front of him. Struck him out. two innings the White Sox have had three walks a single a double a balk a wild pitch nothing to show for it Bob Costas and Tony Kubek in Baltimore the White Sox lead it two to nothing Orioles batting last half of the eighth Singleton hits the first pitch off the fist into shallow center and Rudy Law will get there one out Bob, Lamar Hoyt has been taken for granted so often. Last year, as we've mentioned, 19 wins, no votes for Cy Young Award. There's left on base, White Sox 8, Orioles 2, and the White Sox still lead 2 to nothing. It's a typical, I don't want to say a whole hum game for Lamar Hoyt, but he's gotten 13 ground ball outs. He struck out just three. He's not yet allowed to walk. This is the way he's pitched for two years. Rich Dowell. A strike. The report we have just gotten, there are blue skies just above us, but a report from our producer Kenny Edmondson to the Weather Service, heavy rains are on their way, not too far away. But we can't see it at this point. Now that bullpen, there's a beautiful panoramic shot of the city of Baltimore, part of the Chesapeake Bay. The White Sox bullpen starts going. This one could be trouble. No, it's going to hang up there long enough for Rudy Law to record his second put out of the inning. There's never been much question. Tommy Lasorti had Rudy Law with the Dodgers, stole some bases for him, about his ability to cover ground. Right, left, center field, Rudy Law. There are the numbers for Hoyt thus far, seven and two thirds. The throwing arm has been questioned of Rudy Law, and he can be erratic. But he got this ball in a hurry, positioned perfectly. Traveling secretary, batting practice pitcher Glenn Rosenbaum, somewhere upstairs, positioning the defense for Tony LaRusso. Todd Cruz now. He's one for two as he takes strike one. Two outs, nobody on. Interesting right here that two run down, Elta Belli has not gone to pinch hitters. Something he's done during the course of the season for the bottom three in his order. One and one. He has two. Lefty swingers on his bench in Joe Nolan and Jimmy Dwyer. Switch hitters Shelby. Mm -hmm. And then right handed hitters like Renneke, Landrum, Sakata, and Ayala. Pop back 
Fisk off with a mask and takes it. He busted him inside with a fastball and fisted him. So Lamar Hoyt has yielded but three hits through eight and leads it two to nothing as we go to the top half of the ninth in Baltimore. And the focus shifts to Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles tonight. Broadcast time from there, 8 Eastern time. Vin Scully and Joe Garagiola preceded by Len Berman and Tom Seaver with the pregame show. Now Scott Fletcher to lead it off. Eight. They will lose for the first time in the opening game of a playoff or World Series in their franchise's history. Once again, Todd Cruz at third, forced in. They've had the infield in for this Oriole team at the corners and a couple of times in the middle of the diamond most of the game. Again, the threat of not only a steal, but the threat of the speed and the problems it can cause. Ball one from Martinez to Fletcher. That's the one constant that players can have unless, of course, you've got to pull muscles. That speed, that intimidating factor. along with Dibzinski a stabilizing force in what once was a chaotic situation on the left side of the White Sox infield this year of course shortstop an area that has been patrolled proudly in the White Sox past by the likes of Luke Appling Luis Aparicio one and two to Fletcher two balls and two strikes to Fletcher Kind of situation where, and I'm not saying Tippy Martinez is going to get overworked because he's not pitching that much, but with no off day, if he has to come in a couple of times in a row, you can upset your bullpen. Full count. One thing Tippy Martinez has said, he said, I know my role better with Joel Tabelli than I do, did with Earl Weaver. And I know I'm a short reliever, know how many times I'm going to get up, know the situation to prepare myself for. Usually come in ball games, not much this year when they're down by two runs. But managing in a short series a little different than 162. He walked him. There's the radar gun. Registered that at 83 miles an hour. Earl Weaver, the first major league manager to use the radar gun. He picked it up from the former college coach, Danny Litweiler. Weaver experimented with it. Now Davey Nelson will tell him about Tippy's move. Dempsey now is going to get the signal straight. He's calling Murray back in and say, look, if we're going to do it again, try pickoffs, you're going to decoy, Eddie. Let's make sure we've got our signals correct. Also, you've got to wonder if they aren't thinking about Aurelio Rodriguez. If, as we speculated, Rodriguez knew the signs giving for bunt situations first and second no out, why wouldn't he know Eddie Murray's unless he changes it? So maybe they're doing a little reviewing out there while this game's in progress. White Sox have had the leadoff man aboard in each of the last four innings. Only once did they score. That was in the sixth. Cruz takes high, one and one. He takes high, three and one. They want an appeal, but it's not been asked for by McKeon. Darwood Merrill down at first. Count goes three and one. So Tippy Martinez possibly, with his attention divided for a play, has gone behind in the count three and one. Now do you switch and start him? Let's see. Not going. Taking high ball four. Back to back walks to open the ninth. And now Rudy Law who is three for four, a couple of singles and a double. Well, those who face baseball strategy on simple numbers like stolen bases and caught stealing are seeing today thus far that the threat of a play or a steal can be as divisive as a guy going at all, and that's what they wanted to do. Put the thought in the Orioles' mind. Use that speed. The plan devised by Davey Nelson. Out comes Ray Miller. Now let's see with Rudy Law, another bunt situation. There's Tim Stoddard, the right-handed power pitcher. See what kind of play they might try right now in the infield. And they're not just giving hand signals now. Murray is gone to every infielder. So they don't goof it up again. Or 
again for fear that Rodriguez is stealing their signs over in the White Sox dugout. With Todd Cruz, Ripken, Dower, and Dempsey, told them what they're going to try. Wow. The man has grown into this job. Just 39 years of age, and yet, in terms of tenure with one team, Larus has been with his club longer than anybody. As Law bunts it foul longer than any. American League manager except Sparky Anderson with Detroit. So you had a different play. Now Ripken will have a conference with Martinez. Ripken was going to third. Cruz and Martinez were charging. Dower went to second that time, and Eddie Murray pulled back to first base. So two men, third baseman and Tippy Martinez, were covering the entire infield area for a bunt. They may change again. The 0 1 pitch, bunts toward third. Martinez fields. Got him. Fletcher and Leland do not agree, and here comes LaRusso to argue his case. So he'll use his courtroom skills now. Jim Evans down at third base. LaRusso wants an explanation. You just saw the advantage of a left-handed pitcher, the advantage he has on that play over a right-hander. A right-hander would have to turn completely around. Tippy comes up throwing. Here it is from the blimp. Cruz pulls back the opposite two infielders Murray and this time Tippy Martinez covering the area as Cruz retreats he did this ball well Dempsey makes the call you can see the lips of Dempsey telling Martinez where to go Leland trying to steal a call and it was very very close he controlled that play right there took a gamble but Martinez made a brilliant play So a couple of walks, then an unsuccessful sacrifice as the lead runner Fletcher is retired 1-5. Ooh, oh my. was that close. Oh, my. That ball throw almost handcuffed Cruz. Martinez had so much on it, he knew he had to really fire it that Cruz couldn't stretch. He really battled that ball. That was very, very close. Martinez still in hot water. Ball one to Fisk with runners at first and second and one out. Terrific speed on the lines now with Cruz and Law for the White Sox. It's over Martinez's head. Dower's play is to first, and he gets Fisk. Okay, they've had the Oriole defense scrambling, but they keep leaving men on base. One thing the White Sox do not do much of. For a, a pretty good power hitting team, you've got about four sluggers in a row. They were tied for last in the league as far as hitting into double plays, grounding into it with Seattle. Each went into, like, I think, 119. And again, a tribute to Charlie Lau and these forcing the hitters to go the opposite way in double play situations. Martinez hoping to keep the Orioles close, and then in the last of the ninth, it'll be Dempsey, the number nine hitter, then back to the top for Bumbry and Ford. Martinez with speed on the bases, second and third, will pitch from the stretch, which is really what many relievers are doing now, even with nobody on base. Outside and high to Pachorek who's two for three with a walk. Oriole pitchers have issued six free passes today. Boyd hasn't walked anybody, which is par for the course for him. With everything going on offensively for the White Sox. Forget the job that Lamar Hoyt has done this game. He's had to sit on the bench a long, long time, many innings so far, aside from through the rain delay. He hasn't lost anything. to Pachorek, one and two. There it is. White has allowed three run, uh, three base hits. Probably <laughs> her first <laughs> league championship series. Cruz at third. Long throw. Got him. 
so for the third consecutive inning the White Sox threaten but fail to increase their lead which is two nothing as the Orioles prepare for their last licks. Lamar Hoyt hurled one complete game shutout this season. Eleven complete games during the regular campaign and as we noted earlier he comes in riding a 13 game winning streak and hoping for the Cy Young Award on the strength of his record of 24 and 10. He's ahead 2 nothing here and the first man he'll face in the last half of the night is pinch hitter Jimmy Dwyer who will bat for catcher Rick Dempsey. Number 28 Jim Dwyer. with the Red Sox the Cardinals the Giants in the past You're wondering how he's done against Lamar Hoyt Dwyer lifetime one for seven some sprinkles again as Dwyer steps in A few umbrellas pop out Lance Law creeps in at third base foul ball for strike one Something off his fastball that may have turned it over, ran away from Dwyer. Raining harder now. Breaking ball misses one and one. Did you see how Carlton Fisk took that backdoor curveball and tried to just caress it to the outside corner, tried to steal a pitch from home plate umpire Jim McKeon. He did as well as anybody in the game. Sitting up outside again. Look what Hoyt does. Sometimes a catcher, Bob, will argue or discuss the pitch with an umpire, not for the one that was just missed, but for the next one. That's what might have happened. He might have done a nice soft soap job at Jimmy Keats. Hey, look, that breaking ball was right there. I thought we had it. Next thing is a little bit farther outside. It was called a strike. Fastball. The catcher, you better know how to talk to his home plate umpires. This is a one-two pitch. Base Squires. He caught it on the fly for the first out. Mike Squires, the 1981 Gold Glove Award winner in the American League at first base, and if he played more, he'd be a candidate every year. He says that he became an excellent first baseman, digging out low throws and doing things like this because he was a hockey goalie. You take him for granted. But when it came time to hoist, Western Division pennant flag this year because he spent more time in the White Sox organization than he played 11 years. He was the one that ran it up the pole. It's pouring now as Bumbry takes a strike. We mentioned earlier that the Orioles have 36 come from behind victories this year, most in the majors. In addition, they've come from behind in the ninth inning to win eight times. So last minute heroics are not new to them. But Hoyt has shown no signs of weakening. One and one. Over the last 12 hitters to face Lamar Hoyt to show you how strongly he is finishing. 12 hitters, he's retired 12. There was a base hit there, but a double play in the sixth. Down the left field line, and it's going to be out of play. And when they have changed up uh, a whole plate, whether it's their stance or creeping up on the plate, he's done what he's just did right now. Bumbry may have creeped up. Fisk may have saw it, may have seen it, or Hoyt himself, he ran the fastball in on the fist. He gets you out more ways than one. You look outside, he senses it, he jams you. Wiggle, maybe a change. There it is, what and he fans change. it. Well, you called it. That is the first big, big slow change that he has thrown. Took an awful lot off, and he's changed up on his breaking ball a lot. Right you know, with a guy like Hoyt, Dan it's not Ford. just. 89 mile an hour fastball, 75 straight change. There's a variance in between, little off, little on. Dan Ford is the Orioles' last hope. The strikeout of Bumbry was Hoyt's fourth. This ball is hit well in the left center field with Pachorik in pursuit, and it's off the wall on the fly. Ford, who is hobbling, he hurt himself again. Yeah, he may have hurt that foot again. He's got a stand up double, but he needs a runner. You saw the motion toward the dugout. As you mentioned earlier, he was a little doubtful. Pachark playing a very shallow left field. 
course, Ford's run does not mean anything, but he gets about halfway down, and he hit a little soft spot. Told you about him spraining his ankle in the final game of the season on Sunday. He's had treatments for two or three days. So the Orioles got something going. So Ford's hit has brought the tying run of the play to the person of Ripken, and now Tito Landrum, the former Cardinal, runs for it. Just the fourth hit off Hoyt. And very importantly, none of them have been leadoff hits, and he hasn't walked anybody, and none of the hits have come in the same inning. They have never had more than one base runner in an inning. For the first time today, the White Sox bullpen gets going. You'll hear the crowd. Ripken is the tying run. Murray, who's on deck, would be the winning run. One. This may be the kind of situation where Hoyt says, if you're going to get a hit, I'm going to keep it away, keep it in the ballpark, you're going to hit a single. If I come inside, you might take it downtown, it's a tie ball game. 28 year old Lamar Hoyt, born New Year's Day of 1955 at Columbia, South Carolina, fouled off the fists, and back into the stands, 0 and 2. What a pitch. Came inside with a little bit extra on a fastball with Ripken going out over the plate. He's a little late on it. Ford and Ralph Rowe. The outfield is very deep on Ripken. All three outfielders just a few strides from the warning track. They would be deep on anybody because the man on second means nothing. They are deep and put that way by La Russa because you want, do not want to have an extra base hit. Give him a single, let him drive home the run, but keep him out of scoring position. Ooh, close, but it missed. Three straight fastballs to Ripken. What will he do now? Ripken hit 27 out of the park during the regular season. Four straight fastballs. Remember also that Hoyt, he's pitched so well today, allowed 27 home runs this year. Off the fist, and I think it's going to drop. It does. The shutout is spoiled. Landrum scores. It's two to one. Tying run is at first. on Murray the man that they do not want let beat him we saw it last night in Ben and Joe's game we want Guerrero to beat him then want Schmidt to beat him and yet Schmidt beat him and the chant of Eddie Eddie from the Memorial Stadium crowd Murray of course is a switch hitter so the percentage is not involved in switching pitchers this undoubtedly will be Hoyt's last batter he retires him and he wins it if he loses him Lowenstein, a left-handed hitter, is next, and they probably make a move, which Altabelli could counter with a right-handed batter like Renicki. legs Fletcher picks it up steps on second and it's over 
our Miller Highlife player of the game is Lamar Hoyd, who narrowly missed a shutout but goes the distance as Chicago claims game one, two to one, and Miller will award $1,000 to the Special Olympics in the name of Lamar Hoyd. In the last half of the ninth, a run on a couple of two out hits, but a man is left. 2-7-0 and for the White Sox, 1-5-1 and for the Orioles. This league championship series game has been brought to you by Light Beer from Miller. Everything you've always wanted in a beer and less. By Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? By Allstate, we insure your home, your car, your health, your business, and your life. You're in good hands with Allstate. And by the Gillette Natural Razor, the twin blade razor that pivots for a close, comfortable shave. In just about an hour and a half, Ben and Joe will be back with game two from Los Angeles, the Phillies and the Dodgers, and we'll be back here in Baltimore.